uh, had his knee replacement this last week. Uh, he is doing well, and we want to continue to pray for him. The rehab and the physical therapy that he's going through uh, is challenging, but, uh, but he's doing well, as I said. And I don't see Jim this morning. Of course, you know Jim uh, Fritch had, uh, uh, is Jim here? Uh, had a stroke three weeks ago. And uh, this last week, he was finally able to get into uh, his therapy and whatnot. So he feels encouraged with that. But it, again, it's a, a challenging time for he and for Marty. And we want to continue to remember them in our prayers, not only this morning, but throughout uh, the week and the weeks ahead. Of course, we want to uh, pray for others in our congregation that are uh, have challenging circumstances. I see Celeste over here in the back, and you know that she uh, has been undergoing chemotherapy. She uh, covets your prayers, and I think she, did, uh, Celeste, did you were you able to get the report from the doctor? Okay, so we're, we're praying for a good report, but also she anticipates a second round of therapy. So we want to lift her up. Uh, she continued to remain strong, good appetite, uh, and patient uh, as she, as God grants her healing. Uh, there are others in our congregation that have uh, physical circumstances. Some are uh, temporary and acute. Some, some are chronic. We want to be mindful of that and be sensitive to each other as folks are going through uh, difficulties and challenges. It's our custom as well to give you an opportunity to give expression to particular needs that might be on your hearts and minds this morning. You can do that with the lifting of your right hands. Okay, many hands lifted as always. My friends, would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father and our God, we're so very thankful for the privilege of coming to you with our petitions, our supplications, indeed our thanksgiving. We have mention some particular needs of healing, of recovery. We pray in each instance that you would grant grace and strength and encouragement. We recognize that a merry heart maketh good medicine. May each be optimistic and hopeful for the future. Aditi and I lift up our oldest son, Aaron, as he recovers from his car accident as well as the pneumonia. We're thankful that he's home and able to be at church today, and we pray for him for strength and all the challenges that lay before him. We pray, Father, for our covenant children, that you would enfold them in your mighty hands, protect them from harm. In each instance, we pray that our covenant children, whether they be young, even some yet in their mother's womb, and those who are adults and are making their own lives and, and building uh, their families. We pray, Father, that in each instance you would give them godly friends, that you would, in your providence, provide for them friends that would encourage them in the very best things and discourage them from making foolish choices. We pray for the marriages of our church family, that they would be strong, that the men of our congregation would learn the lesson of spiritual leadership, but with love. We pray, Father, that our homes would be a stronghold against the wiles of the evil one and this world, and we would be enabled to be a testament to your grace in our marriages and our homes. And when we have failed, when there have been problems, sometimes conspicuous problems, we pray that even in those instances, you would use those problems to your glory, that it would be a cause to look to Christ rather than perhaps to mere men. We pray, Father, for those who lifted their hands reflecting a particular need or concern just a few moments ago, whatever that need might be, we lift them up to you. I'm mindful that we have uh, pregnant women in our congregation and we lift them up to you. We pray for the babies. We pray for healthy babies and, and a healthy pregnancy. We pray for any challenges, whether they be physical or emotional or financial, uh, that they may be facing, that you would take care of those. We pray, Father, that everyone that lifted a hand would have a special sense of your presence, would be encouraged and built up, that they would purpose to follow Christ Christ with greater obedience. Indeed, that is my pastor's prayer for each one here. 
Now we close with the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Indeed. You may be seated, my friends. Well, take your Bible out, if you would, and turn to 2 Corinthians. Once again, we continue our study uh, this morning, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Our text will be verses 3 and 4 of chapter 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is the Word of God. Would you bow with me in prayer as we ask God to bless this time of study. We thank you, Father, again, for the privilege of coming before you with our worship. May this very important element of worship, the study of Holy Scripture, be blessed by you. Illumine our hearts and minds as we seek to understand the point of this particular text as well as the application. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So we continue our study, as I mentioned earlier, of 2 Corinthians, and uh, we've been going uh, through rather slowly because there's so much here, uh, but there is also, as I've mentioned, a lot of repetition. In fact, in our text today, there's really nothing uh, new that the Apostle presents to us. Uh, he is reiterating some things he's already uh, written about and talked about, and so uh, with that in mind, we're going to try to revisit a few of the points that he's made uh, in previous verses, but I'm hoping that we'll gain a little more understanding of the verses and perhaps a better understanding of how they might be applied in our lives. So I'm going to make six points toward that end. The first one, the gospel that is mentioned in both verses 4 and 5 is not a neutral thing. Let me say that again. The gospel that's mentioned in, in our text today is not a neutral thing. It is a positive truth with the power to save and, if rejected, to condemn. Listen, if you would, to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now listen to this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So once again, let me say that the gospel is not a neutral thing. Uh, it is indeed a very powerful and positive truth unto our salvation, but for those who choose to reject the gospel, it is a cause of greater condemnation for them. Its power to save is the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ that's described for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the Apostle Peter speaking to the same thing, but adding perhaps even a little more detail, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself, that is Christ, bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. We understand then uh, that the power of the gospel is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. His sacrificial death, his substitutionary sacrificial death in our behalf, and the benefits of that are received by the gift of faith from God himself, so that we would believe upon Christ and his work. The power to condemn is, is by providing proof 
of the hostile and antagonistic nature of those who despise, who disdain, or choose to ignore the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the seventh chapter of Acts, uh, there is that wonderful description of the deacon Stephen and his very powerful sermon there to the people in Jerusalem. But what is especially noteworthy in terms of our study today is the reaction uh, that the people there gathered had to this godly man's declaration of the truths of the gospel. This is Stephen. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit, you're doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You have received the law as ordained by angels, yet did not keep it. And this is their response, which illustrates this antagonism uh, that unbelievers have to the truths of the gospel and how the gospel tends to smoke them out, to flesh them out, uh, to force them to reveal their true nature. And this was their response uh, to the deacon Stephen's sermon. Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. And of course you know the rest of the story, don't you? Uh, that they would stone Stephen to death. Even Saul, who would become our apostle Paul, was giving his consent, perhaps even supervising the stoning of the godly man Stephen. Understand, when the gospel is declared and proclaimed without compromise, with clarity, it does arouse the antagonism and hostility and the unregenerate. Second point, the gospel ought to be shared indiscriminately with all men. Not, not only, but some men, of course, may receive Christ as he's offered in the gospel, but some men we know will reject Christ as he's offered in the gospel. So in spite of that, notwithstanding that, we are nevertheless charged with the responsibility of what I would call indiscriminate preaching and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ to all men. We understand that when we share the gospel with others, uh, that only those who have been given ears to hear and eyes to see what the gospel is the benefit of the gospel for them and who Jesus Christ truly is. Only those regenerate folk will respond positively to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think of Acts chapter 13, verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the Lord, the word of the Lord, as many as had been, listen to this, appointed to eternal life. Believe. I've shared before and I know you're patient with me as I repeat uh, my illustrations and anecdotes, but I've shared before as we uh, were doing the angel tree uh, Christmas party for the children of, of incarcerated fathers and mothers in Comal County, and we would have uh, really a lot of kids and families would come out uh, for that. And I, I had a habit at the very end as they were leaving, as we'd given them their gifts from their parents, and some other uh, things that we provided for them, I would always uh, tell the kids, uh, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Over and over. They'd go out, Jesus loves you. Sometimes they would be startled, and I would get in their face, and I'd say, no, understand, Jesus loves you. And I think I've shared uh, with you, as I said, more than once, that, that someone, a fellow in our congregation, actually uh, sent me uh, sort of an antagonistic email, and he chastised me for telling these children that Jesus loved them. He said, you don't have any right to do that, preacher. You, you don't know who the elect are. You don't know that Jesus really loves these children. And so I was thinking, as uh, I was reflecting on what he said, well, I suppose the better thing would have been to say to the children, Jesus may love you, but he may not. Now, 
if you think just logically through that, that's so foolish. The idea that we have to make those sorts of caveats and qualifications when we tell people uh, that Jesus loves them or share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, uh, it, we understand that only those who have been given ears to hear by God Himself and eyes to see Christ as He is, again, by God Himself, only those will really hear the gospel. It's not our business to, to discriminate between one person or another and suppose that this person probably is elect and this person is not. This person comes from the right kind of family. This, this person comes from the wrong kind of family. So we might assume uh, that this person is not one of the elect. That's so foolish. And many times I've heard over the years Reformed folk who take this idea of election and predestination and it causes them to actually refrain from sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a great mistake, I think, to do that. Great mistake. Third point, those who reject Christ, those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ are already perishing. Listen again to verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. They are already in the process of perishing. We don't necessarily have to just wait for eternity, for their death and what comes after that. Now, those who reject Christ are already in the process of perishing. You might think of, of decay. Uh, uh, you see all these zombie programs with the, the zombies, you know, as time goes on, they they their skin and whatnot begins to rot and decay and parts of their bodies fall off. Understand, uh, kiddos, I'm not recommending those shows to you, so don't have to ask your parents later if it, Pastor Dick was telling you to watch the, um, the Walking Dead or something like that. I'll just give you little sketches about those shows occasionally. But the picture is really quite telling, instructive consequences of decisions and choices they've made. But that said, there, it's not over till it's over. We always have the hope that those folks who have rejected the gospel up to a certain point will accept Christ as he's offered in the gospel at some point in their life before, before their death. The, the oldest person that I had the, the honor of seeing saved uh, was a fellow that was about 77 years old. He, he was an interesting guy, had been a, a military uh, pilot uh, in the Air Force and had all kinds of experiences under his belt, but he had never trusted in Christ. And even at that age, he trusted in Christ. It's never too late until it's too late. But understand, that present tense here, the idea that those who reject Christ are already in a process of perishing, uh, perhaps understanding that will give us some sense of urgency as we see the folks that need to hear the gospel of Christ around us. The fourth point, the devil, who Paul calls the God of this world in verse 4, actively opposes the gospel, doing all that he can to mislead, to misrepresent, to confuse, to up escape uh, the simple truth of the gospel and he's quite effective in our prelude a mighty fortress as i was reading some of the first stanza there i i was thinking about uh, these words for still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal uh, that is the God of this world that's being referenced there. Understand that the evil one is at work. He will do everything he possibly can uh, to cause folks to reject or ignore or misunderstand the gospel of Jesus Christ. If he can, if he's able to, to find his way into a Bible teaching church, a gospel preaching church, he'll do everything he can to confuse the gospel, to, to confuse those who would declare the gospel to the congregation, to the preachers, the teachers. He'll do everything he can to cause them to in some way distort the simple truth of the gospel. The gospel is quite simply described for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. We 
declared this in our affirmation of faith earlier, didn't we? Uh, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and, and rose on the third day according to the Scriptures for our justification. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9-11, through 11, there is a prophetic passage speaking of a future time in which the man of lawlessness is revealed and, and Satan will do all that he can to deceive uh, those who would trust in Christ as he's offered in the gospel. Let me read verses 9-11 to to you. This is not only something we anticipate in the future, but it is something that has been going on. Even as the Apostle John said, uh, the spirit of the Antichrist is with us even now. We understand that the work of the God of this world, uh, the anti-Christian spirit is present even in this age. The one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. What happens when someone refuses to believe the gospel that has been declared to them as they actually end up believing a deception of some kind. They become deluded. Often what happens, of course, in many instances, is those who reject the gospel are antagonized. They are provoked by the gospel of Christ. Sometimes folks simply seem to ignore it, like it just goes over their heads, water off a duck's back. But more often than not, what happens in the psychology of the unregenerate as he hears the gospel but, but rejects or ignores it, he takes the particulars of the gospel, what he's hearing, uh, and he puts them in compartments that are non-threatening, that, that he can deal with, that he feels like he can control. And so when you talk to folks out there, occasionally when you talk about uh, something as stark as the gospel of Christ, sometimes you, you do get uh, agitation and an aggressive response. Sometimes someone just acts indifferent. But sometimes someone will say something like, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, that works for you. It doesn't work for me. I believe Jesus does and so. What, they, what they're describing there is the very prevalent tendency in our culture and our society today to take the truths of Scripture and to change them enough where they can put them in categories that are non-threatening. People do this all the time. And so we recognize that the evil one is very, very involved in this process. Let me read this brief excerpt from Charles Hodge. He was probably one of the foremost, well, I'll say he was the foremost theologian uh, beginning with the antebellum period in the 19th century and going on uh, toward the 20th century. Charles Hodge, he was a professor at Princeton uh, Theological Seminary uh, before it apostatized. But this is what he said about the devil. The God of this world, that is Satan, who is called the God of this world because of the power which he exercises over the men of the world and because of the servile obedience which they render to him, to Satan. They are taken captive by him at his will. It is not necessary in order that men should serve Satan and even worship him that they should intend to do so or even that they should know that such a being exists. You see what he's saying there? He's saying that people uh, actually serve Satan and they don't really know most, in most instances that they're serving the devil. It is enough that he actually controls them and that they fulfill His purposes as implicitly as the good fulfill the will of God. Not to serve God is to serve Satan. Do you get that? Remember I said that the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not neutral? Jesus Himself said, you're either for me or against me. Uh, there, it's a binary choice. There's a dichotomy in, this, in the spiritual realm where one can acquiesce to the truths of Scripture and the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ or the other option is to serve the God of this world. Not to serve God is to serve Satan. There is no help for it. 
If Jehovah be not our God, Satan is. He is therefore called the prince of this world. The fifth point I want to make, though the devil is the god of this world, he is a finite, limited being. He is not omnipresent. That word meaning that he's not limited to space and time. If he were omnipresent, he could be many different places at once. But the devil is limited to space and time. He can only be, the devil can only be at one place at one time. Now he has his minions, his demonic spirits following him, but they also are finite, a limited number. And so we recognize uh, that he cannot be everywhere as God himself can. The devil, the God of this world, is not omniscient. That's a word that means all-knowing. He doesn't know everything. Uh, he is a predictor of the future. He is a chess player, as we, as we establish at our Wednesday study. He is a strategist. He understands cause and effect. He understands uh, that he can set certain moves up that will have a certain outcome in the future. But he doesn't truly know the future, just little bits of it. And he's deceived, self-deceived in his understanding of what the future holds. Nor is he omnipotent. And that word means all-powerful. We must always keep this in mind, that Satan is not all-powerful. He is a formidable foe, but he is not all-powerful. Only God is omnipotent. And so we have in the God of this world, the devil, Satan, we have this limited, finite being that cannot do anything that he is not granted permission to do. We must keep that in our mind so as not to fear the God of this world. But that said, we must take him very seriously. The sixth and final point, the veil, we talked a lot about the veil, the veil over the hearts and minds of the unbeliever is lifted at regeneration. Now, now I want to make a subtle point here, but I think it's an important one. This veil over the minds and hearts of, of the unbeliever is lifted at his regeneration. You recall regeneration, that theological term uh, for what our Lord described as being born again in, in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, right? You must be born again, Nicodemus. To be regenerated is to be born again. It's when God, the Holy Spirit, uh, takes our heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. He quickens us so that we can receive the truth of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. But now this is the subtle point I want to make. Even the unregenerate, even those who remain not born again, will have, listen to this, glimpses of truth of the gospel. I use that word very purposely. Glimpses of the truth of the gospel. Particular times, specific moments in which the unbeliever sees, he gets a glimpse of, of who Christ is and, and what Christ has done for man. There may even be, following these glimpses of truth in the irregenerate, there may even be an external positive manifestation, uh, uh, what appears to be a positive response to the gospel, but it will never, ever last. It simply will not last. This is exactly what our Lord had in mind when He described the parable of the sower. And so in the Gospel of Luke, uh, in the 8th chapter, beginning with verse 4, let me read it to you. When a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell under the road and was trampled under the foot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil. And as soon as he grew up, it grew up rather, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And he said these things, as he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears, let him hear. And you, you hear the allusions and the reference I've made earlier in our study in the course of our Lord's parable of the sower. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest, it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
those beside the road are those who have heard when the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with the worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. Listen to this. But the seed in the good soil... These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. The parable of the sower explains to us that not everyone who appears to positively respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ has truly, has truly believed in Christ as he's offered in the gospel. We must be mindful of this. Over time, over sometimes an extended period of time, we see ultimately the nature of their faith, whether it be a true faith or a diabolical faith. As James said, you do well to, to believe in God, even the demons, even the devil believes in God and he fears God. That diabolical faith would be understanding something of the facts of the gospel and, and giving an assent to something of the truth of the gospel, but having no personal trust in the gospel, not understanding one's sin before our holy God, not understanding that one is hopeless and helpless to redeem himself apart from casting themselves with abandon upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now that's saving faith. In the parable of the sower, you have three instances of soil representing the hearts that were not truly regenerated. And once again, I call your attention to my, I think, a rather subtle point that there are, even in the unregenerate, there are these glimpses of the truth of the gospel when people respond, sometimes get excited. Sometimes it's because of the quite effective manipulation of a very gifted preacher who knows how to get uh, folks to respond positively. We must be careful with that. And that's why you guys have uh, seen to it that you have an ineffective preacher. So that not heaven. But our emotions are liable to manipulation, and sometimes you see this. Folks will do things. Now, in Presbyterian circles, we don't have altar calls. I personally am not opposed uh, to altar calls if they're done in a certain way. I certainly am not opposed to giving an invitation to trust in Jesus Christ, as some uh, who would agree with me on Reformed doctrine would be. But nevertheless, I recognize that people can be manipulated. Sometimes it's a bad thing because what happens, you know, they think, well, I've already done that. When, when they fall away and they hear the gospel again, they say, well, I tried that. It didn't work for me. I did that. Been there, done that. And so they become sort of jaded and, and calloused to the gospel. And for that reason, uh, we want to be cautious that we're explaining the truth in the most winsome way we possibly can sharing the gospel with folks, but we don't want to push them or prod them beyond what they're ready to do because their heart has been changed. Let me sum up with these points. The gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. It's what, that's what euangelion, the Greek word, means good news. For all who recognize that they are sinners separated from God, it is not good news. It's necessarily, logically, rationally not good news for people who don't see their sin because they don't see the point of it. For those who can't or won't see their own sin, the gospel may provoke, as I said earlier, it may be ignored or it may be distorted. The devil, understand the God of this world, will do whatever he can to blind people to the truth of the gospel. If you wonder why this family member or this friend or this co-worker or this neighbor after an extended period of time when you continue to share the gospel with them and try to explain to them who Jesus was and what he's done for them and they continue to reject, you understand that this is a spiritual struggle. That in the spiritual realm there, there, there are things that are going on that are not always obvious to us. And if we understand the Scripture and the Apostle Paul's warning that many are 
uh, have their hearts and their minds veiled to the gospel, then we begin to understand that if we want to see a positive effect of sharing the gospel with someone, we must undergird our efforts with diligent and purposeful prayer. That is where spiritual battles are won, on our knees. But the gospel applied to the heart and the soul of a man by faith that's been given to him by God, by repentance unto life, to trust in Christ alone. This changes lives. And so we can take comfort in the fact that the gospel is the power unto salvation for the Jew first and then also the Gentile. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We are encouraged even as we are challenged by what we have studied this morning as we anticipate sitting at our Lord's table, the administration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We pray that our hearts would be stayed upon the redemption found in Christ alone. Enable us, Father, uh, to live lives that are pleasing to you, to walk in greater faithfulness and obedience uh, to your commandments, and where we have stumbled, where we've faltered, as we all do. We pray, Father, that you would lift us up and put us back on the narrow way. Remind us that we are saved by grace through faith, and not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man boast. We understand then that our salvation, our redemption, is a matter of grace. And so even when we live in a manner, we do things, we think things uh, that are contrary to your holy commandments. We recognize that we are saved by grace. We are held by your great power in your strong hands. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.